This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, where website design is made easy. What is going on everybody? My name is John Solo and today on Messed Up Origins we're actually revisiting a story that we talked about way back during this show's inception over two years ago. That story is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, or should I say Snowdrop. No, I'm gonna say Snow White. Now, unlike the episode where we went back and revisited Cinderella because the first time around I mistook it for a Grimm Brothers original, Snow White actually was a Grimm Brothers original. However, I was able to find an even earlier edition than we talked about last time, as well as some notes from their unpublished rendition. On top of all that, I found an even older story that, while different, the Grimm Brothers likely took inspiration from. In other words, we've got a lot of to talk about today. And I don't know about you, but I am very excited to get into it. But I'm always excited to get into it because I'm a nerd. Before we do though, I gotta give a shout out to this week's sponsor and friend of the show, Squarespace. Tell me, Solo fam, have you ever wanted to have a website of your own to show off your art, music, or merchandise, but didn't know how to go about doing it? I mean, sure, you could learn how to code, but that could take literally centuries and you would be dead by the time you were done designing the homepage. That's where Squarespace comes in. They're an all-in-one platform that gives you the ability to create a beautiful website from within your browser, so there's nothing for you to install or update ever. They have a wide variety of themes and templates you can choose from and mess around with to make sure your website looks exactly how you want it, whether you're setting up a gallery, blog, or store. And you can buy domains through them too, so your perfect website can have the perfect name. As many of you know, I use them to set up MessedUpOrigins.com, which I've recently updated with a page that allows you to learn about and purchase my favorite resources for researching fables and fairy tales, and a link to my merch store where you can buy the brand new Solo Fam John Shop First merchandise. Isn't it beautiful? They are, without a doubt, the best service for you to boost your online presence or launch your passion project. If you want to try them out, just go to squarespace.com slash John Solo to start your free trial and use coupon code John Solo to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And now it's time for us to get started. As always, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe for weekly content just like this, and most importantly, enjoy. So the very first rendition of the story we call Snow White and that one overly ambitious translator called Snow Drop was published in 1812 by Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm. In total, there were 17 editions of this story, with the final edition being published in 1857. I'm breaking down the first edition today though, and as I do that, I'll be touching on some of the major differences with both later and earlier drafts. Now our story opens with a queen sewing by a windowsill, watching the snowflakes fall, as one does. She ends up pricking her finger with a needle, I'm assuming because she was distracted by the beautiful snowflakes, and three drops of her blood fall on the snow, causing her to have a totally normal thought. If only I could have a daughter that was as white as the snow, as red as my blood, and as black as the ebony windowsill. I can low-key relate. The other day I spilled orange juice on Gunther's pee pad, which had a little brown stain on it, and I couldn't help but think, Lord, please let my kid look just like that. Well, unlike me, the queen got her wish. Lucky her. Fast forward six years and Snow White has grown into a beautiful little girl that everyone adores and her mother is jealous of. And this jealousy hits its breaking point when one morning the queen asks her magic mirror who in this land is fairest of all and it answers Snow White. Or to be specific, it says, you my queen are fair, it is true, but Snow White is a thousand times fairer than you. A thousand times. Pretty harsh words. Well, naturally, this infuriates the incredibly insecure queen, so she launches a plot to have Snow White killed. She orders a huntsman to bring her seven-year-old daughter deep in the woods, stab her to death, and to bring back her lungs and liver so she can eat them with salt. Now, whether you find that disgusting or delicious, I think you'd be interested in learning what the queen's scheme was in the rough draft. Instead of having someone kill the girl so she could eat her, the plan was simply to lead the girl into the woods herself under the guise of picking flowers and just abandon her there. It's not as gruesome but it's definitely still messed up to do to your own daughter. Now, there's no official explanation as to why they made the plan so much more horrifying for the official publication, but some say it's because of the old belief that witches and dark fairies ate children and the Grimms were trying to hint that the mom was affiliated with them somehow. To make it slightly less traumatizing for kids, the 1819 edition was altered so that the real mom dies during childbirth and the stepmom was the antagonist, but let's be honest, did that really do any good? Back to the story though, fortunately for Snow White, the hunt 
huntsman took pity on her and told her to run away to some place that her mom couldn't find her. Meanwhile, he killed a wild boar and brought its lungs and liver to the queen in place of Snow White's. After wandering alone and scared for a while, Snow White finds a tiny little house that for some reason has seven of everything, from chairs and beds to forks and spoons. The girl helps herself to just a tiny bit of food and wine at each play setting and then passes out in one of the beds, but not before pulling a Goldilocks and trying out each one without bothering to remake it. When the owners of the house, aka the seven dwarves, come home that night, they find Snow White sleeping, and because she looks so sweet and innocent, they make sure not to disturb her until the morning. The dwarf whose bed she took shared a bed with each of his brothers for an hour that night, so you know he didn't get his REM. And that shit's valuable, so he was making a sacrifice. The next morning, Snow White wakes up to see the dwarves all staring at her, and after recovering from shock, she tells them her story about how she ended up there. They take pity on the poor girl and say that she can live with them for as long as she needs if she promises to make them dinner and keep the place clean. A fair trade, I'd say. Now cut to the evil queen doing her usual morning routine. She asks her magic mirror who is the fairest of them all, and to her horror, it responds, You, my queen, are fair, it is true, but little Snow White beyond the seven mountains is a thousand times fairer than you. The queen knew that no one lived beyond the mountains except for the seven dwarves, so it must have been them who rescued her daughter. The evil queen then vowed that Snow White would die even if it killed her in the process, and what follows are her three three attempts at murdering her. The first time, she goes to the dwarf's house disguised as an old peddler woman selling lace, and when Snow White buys some, she offers to lace her up properly. Back when I first talked about this, I just assumed she was referring to a corset of some sort, but after doing some more research, I found out that she was talking about Snow White's bodice, or vest. Well, she ends up lacing it too tight, causing Snow White to pass out from a lack of oxygen, and she runs away. Luckily, the dwarves come back, find the unconscious seven-year-old, cut her laces so she can breathe again, and she wakes up. The next day, the queen learns that Snow White survived, so she disguises herself differently and travels to the cabin with a poisoned comb. At first, Snow White said she couldn't let anyone in, but then she saw the comb, and well, it was a really nice comb. She let the mysterious stranger brush her hair with it, and she passed out immediately, but once again that night, the dwarves came back and pulled it from her head, saving her life. Now, on the third day, when the queen found out Snow White still wasn't dead, she was furious beyond belief. She decided she needed a plan that was absolutely foolproof and crafted a poison apple. She disguised herself again and went back, but this time Snow White said she couldn't buy anything or let anyone inside because the dwarves would be mad at her. Note that she didn't say it was because someone was out there trying to kill her and that she almost died twice in the past two days. Nah, it's because the dwarves would be mad at her. Seven-year-olds are funny. The queen was a tricksy one, though. She only poisoned half the apple, so she took a bite out of the safe side to convince Snow White that it was okay, then handed it to her through the window at no charge. But barely a moment after the apple touched the girl's lips, she fell dead. The seven dwarves came home and found Snow White's dead bod, but this time they couldn't find a way to save her. Still, the girl didn't look dead, so they didn't want to bury her. Instead, they stored her in a glass coffin inside their house to keep her safe. Now, fast forward a few years to when a prince comes to the dwarf seeking shelter her, see Snow White's dead bod, and insists that they give her to him. He said she was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen, and if they gave her to him, he'd look at her every single day and make sure she was taken care of. At first, they thought he was a freak and said no, but he wouldn't stop begging, so eventually they took pity on him and said, fine, take her, you weirdo. But the prince kept his word. He spent every minute with Snow White's body that he could. He had all of his meals with her and would get extremely sad on the rare occasion he had to leave her. This next part is my favorite, though. After a while, the servants got sick and tired of hauling the casket around just so he didn't have to be separated from the corpse that he was weirdly obsessed with. So one of the servants opened up the coffin, propped up Snow White, and took out his frustration by smacking her in the back. This caused the piece of poison apple to become dislodged from her throat, and she woke up just like that. I can't help but wonder if the servant ever came clean to the prince about how exactly he saved her. Because the prince would no doubt have some questions, but if the servant told him the truth, I would have to imagine the prince would be pretty pissed off. I mean, he punched her in the back. How would he explain that without sounding like an asshole? Anyway, the prince and Snow White had their first dinner that same night and agreed to marry the next day. Another interesting and odd note, in an unpublished draft of the story, Snow White was saved in a different way. In that one, it's her father who finds her coffin and he orders his royal physicians to revive her by tying her body to ropes connected to the four corners of the room. I can't say for certain, but I'm assuming they changed it because that 
doesn't make any fucking sense. In an effort to make the story more kid-friendly in later editions, like the one we talked about in my original Snow White video, she's saved because either the prince or servant carrying her coffin tripped, jolting her and dislodging the apple from her throat. I still love the servant smacking her though, just because it's so ridiculous to think he would do that to a little girl who's 10 years old at most. It seems like something straight out of Monty Python. Anyway, the following morning, Snow White's mother went to the magic mirror for her daily ego boost, but was shocked to hear that the young queen was now the fairest in the land. Note that it didn't say Snow White, so she didn't know who it was referring to. Out of jealousy and anger, the evil queen went to the young queen's wedding just to get a good look at her face and almost died of shock when she saw that her daughter was standing at the altar, years after she thought she killed her. It's too bad she didn't die from shock though, because to punish her for her wicked ways, the new king and queen forced her to put on red hot iron shoes and dance until she died. Ouch. Call me a sick fuck if you must, but I think my favorite part of these old fairy tales is finding out how the villain gets punished for their evil deeds. It's always so gruesome, but then you remember all the horrible things that character did and you're like, well, sounds fair. But now that we've gone over the Snow White story in its truest form, it's time we take a look at a story from hundreds of years prior that likely helped the Grimm's write their own version. So like I said, the Snow White story was a Grimm Brothers original, but that doesn't mean they didn't take some inspiration from other fairy tales. Unfortunately, we don't know which ones because all of their manuscripts have been either lost or destroyed, but there are other stories that follow a similar format and are believed to have been referenced by the Grimm's. That format being the heroine's expulsion from home, the various threats on her life culminating with apparent death, and her rescue and reawakening. There's one story in particular that follows this structure that experts also believe was one of the Grimm's sources because it was written almost 200 years prior. And that is The Young Slave, one of the many stories featured in Giambattista Basile's Pentamarone collection. It's a pretty interesting one too, because it seems to have elements from several famous princess stories, including Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty. Basically what happens is a girl gets pregnant after swallowing a rose petal and an angry fairy curses her child to die at the age of seven. You see, she was actually on her way to give the child a blessing after she was born, but she tripped and hurt her ankle, so she cursed her instead. While the seven years go by, the girl, whose name is Lisa, is killed when her mom is combing her hair and the comb's teeth penetrate her skull, and instead of being buried, she's placed inside of seven crystal coffins. Don't ask me why, but I'm sure you already see the numerous similarities with Snow White. Lisa's mom ends up dying soon after this, and her uncle, who I'm calling Larry, is left to look over her body. The years go by, Lisa stays dead, but continues to grow, as well as the casket somehow, and eventually Larry gets married. But in true fairy tale fashion, his new wife is a total b you see, when Larry is out of town on a hunting trip, his wife, who we'll call Dolores, discovers Lisa in a room of the house she had never been in. And because Lisa had continued to age while dead, she thought she was her husband's mistress who was just sleeping. She pulled Lisa out of the casket, knocking the comb from her hair and causing her to wake up, but Dolores didn't exactly give her a warm welcome back to the mortal plane. She cut off her hair, made her put on tattered clothes, and beat her face until she was unrecognizable. As a result of this, when Lisa's uncle returned from his hunting trip the next day, Dolores told him that Lisa was a slave she was sent as a gift, and because he didn't recognize her, he believed her. Unlike his wife though, Larry treated Lisa with respect, and on one occasion he even gave her a doll as a gift. And it's a good thing he did, because one day Larry overhears Lisa telling the doll her life story while sharpening a knife and threatening to kill herself if it didn't respond. In other words, she was losing it. While Larry ends up bursting through the door, he has Lisa retell her life story so he can confirm that it's really her, and when he knows for sure, he sends her away to live with some relatives for a few weeks to recover. When she returns, looking as beautiful as ever, he throws a banquet for her, has her tell her life story to the guests who are all weeping by the end of it, and then he dumps his wife in front of everybody. The cherry on top is that he sets Lisa up with a handsome gentleman of her choice, and everyone lives happily ever after. Another gruesome some tail, another happy ending. Now in addition to the similarities in structure I mentioned before starting the story, you may have also noticed that it provides answers to two specific questions people always have when they hear about the original Snow White. One, if she fell unconscious when she was seven, then how long was she in the casket for so that she was old enough to get married when she woke up? And two, if she did indeed age and grow during those years in the casket, how did she continue to fit? Well in The Young Slave, it specifically says that Lisa grew and aged while unconscious and that the casket, for whatever reason, grew with her. I actually don't have anything that I'm building up to by making that point, I just thought it was interesting. Now, The Young Slave is obviously not the only story that influenced the Grimm's writing, but unfortunately, because of the lost manuscripts, it's one of the 
only ones we can reliably connect to it. Many of the other stories in Snow White's tale type, ATU 709, appropriately called Snow White, weren't published until the Grimm's released their collection. That doesn't mean those same tales weren't shared orally before Snow White was written. In fact, many of them were. It's just that there's no written record of their existence prior. We've been here for a while, so I'll wait to break those down until a future episode. For now, I just wanna know your thoughts on what you heard today. Which rendition of Snow White did you like best? And what details did you find to be the most messed up? Let me know your thoughts in a comment down below. And when you're done, make sure to hit that like button like it's a 10 year old girl whose casket you've had to haul around all day. If someone heard that line without comment, context, I'm pretty sure they'd think I'm a psychopath. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button to join the solo fam and get content like this delivered to your sub box on a weekly basis, and follow me on social media because I'm in desperate need of validation from strangers. That's why I'm a YouTuber. Gunther needs it too, so if you want to see this adorable mush face on your timeline, give him a follow on Instagram. And don't worry, I won't be offended if you only follow him and not me. I am fully aware that he is the handsome one. I'll be seeing you guys next week with a special holiday-themed episode of Messed Up Origins. Until then, my name is John. John Solo, and remember, John shot first.